All right, today our topic is arranging or organizing. If you're wondering what that means, um, you, will, oops, you will remember that we are looking at the five, we're approaching communications in, in homiletics from the point of view of classical rhetoric. And in classical rhetoric, there are five categories. Last week we looked at invention or inventario, today arrangement or uh, depositio, and then style, memory, delivery, and then we'll talk about the act of preaching and teaching and then applying the principles of final exam. So th these are the five canons. Last week, as I said, we looked at invention, which means evaluating your purpose and developing the argument or message appropriate to your audience. What do you want or need to say and why do you need to say it for this particular audience? We talked about that last week. Today, we want to talk about the second of the five stages of rhetoric, and that is arrangement, or diposivio, arranging or organizing the argument or message for best effect. How do I structure and organize my message to best communicate with this audience? Um, the, let me talk a little bit about that in terms of the, again, the classical rhetoric. Um, one of the first major Greek writers on the issue of rhetoric was Aristotle. And Aristotle said there were two major parts to an effective rhetorical address. And remember, rhetoric is communication for the sake of influencing, to convince people of something. Which, my argument early on in this class was, I believe that's true of any communication. Any communication you do is an effort to persuade. If, if of nothing else, then you want to persuade them that you're worth listening to. And so um, Aristotle said the two major parts of any discourse or rhetorical uh, presentation was the statement of the case and the proof of the case. But then he came back and said, but it also, in almost every case, it requires an introduction on the front end and a conclusion on the back end. So he identified four sections. Introduction, statement of the case, proof of the case, and conclusion. Later on, uh, other writers on rhetoric who are seen more as being the formal um, the fathers of rhetoric as we understand it, uh, particularly Quintilian and Cicero, you might think it's Cicero, but in Latin it would be Cicero, they were both writers on rhetoric, and they identified that there were six parts. These, um, these pieces... Um, and so as we get into any argument, we want to talk about the six pieces of the, um, the, actually, I like the six pieces that are part of the actual arrangement when you are arranging this. The first part is called the introduction or exordium in Latin. Exordium means to urge forward. In other words, when you do an introduction, the goal of this is to to get people into it, to launch them into this consideration of what you're presenting so that they are pulled into it, they're urged forward in your argument. Um, the, the old adage that there's three stages to any effective presentation, you tell people what you're going to tell them, you tell them, and then you tell them what you told them, very much fits into this six-part structure of the organization of your talk. Um, so the first part is the introduction, tell them what is at stake and why it's important. Pull them into it. Why should they care about this? You know, where are you going and why? And why do they care? So tell them what you're going to tell them. And you do that in a brief introduction. Secondly, you then state the case or the narratio. In this case, you give the main arguments, you give all the relevant information necessary to support the main argument. Um, and uh, Quintilian explained it like this in a, in a legal case. And by the way, you've all seen all the, the legal procedural dramas on television, all the TV shows, and the attorneys will get up in their opening comments and they'll go, I will demonstrate to you that blah, blah, blah had the motive, the opportunity, and the, you know, the means to commit this crime. And then in fact his motivation was such that you, know, you, will, you will find no reasonable way to decide that he is not guilty of this crime, right? Those are the opening comments. You're sort of giving a, a, a cursory review of everything you're going to say in order to pull them into it so that they expect your argument as it's coming along. That's the, the introduction, exordium. 
And then you state the case. Um, Quintilian, giving the a legal case as an example, because <coughs> our basic structure for, for rhetoric was used as how to try legal cases as long ago as the Greeks and the Romans. And so that's the, that's the model that we use today. Quintilian said in the Narachio, for instance, in a legal case, we shall, for instance, represent a person accused of theft as covetous, accused of adultery as lustful, accused of homicide as rash, or attribute, it, attribute the opposite qualities to those persons if we are defending them. Further, we must do the same with place, time, and life. You make your case in the second state, the Narachio, okay? Give the main argument all the rel relevant information. This is the tell them part. Introduction, tell them what you're going to tell them. Then you tell them. Then, to support that, you outline the major points, the partitio, it's called. Name the issues in dispute, list the arguments to be used in the order they will appear. The fourth is the proof of the case, or confirmatio. Confirm or validate content that you gave them in the narratio and partitio. In, in other words, here's, here's your evidence for what you've said. You support it as you go along. Then, part five, you refute the possible opposing arguments, the confutatio. Have any of you all been involved in debate, formal debate? These kind of rhetorical tools are used in debate. And one of the principles in debate is you want to make the other side's argument first before they do and then dismiss it. Say why it's not valid. Because then if they stand up and make that argument, you've taken all the wind out of their sails. So that is part of this as well. That you refute possible arguments. You anticipate that some people who are in your listening audience might disagree or that there might have been previous arguments that they have heard against what you're representing. You need to address that in your talk. Um, and then finally, the conclusion, uh, peroratio to sum up the arguments and arouse sympathy for your case. This is the tell of what you just told them. All right, now these six stages, and you may say, well, how does that fit into a sermon? You know, how does all of that work? Each of these things, and backing up again, I don't have all these in one, the introduction, the stating of the case, outlining the major points, the proof of the case, to refute possible opposing arguments, and then to draw you a conclusion in which you try to to get their final agreement with you, either by sympathy. And actually, uh, the original Latin version of this, they said that in the conclusion, you should either um, sum up your arguments, arouse sympathy for the case, or make it clear that anybody who disagrees with you is an idiot, basically. You know, that you, you, you uh, attribute negative either motivations or, or character qualities to anybody who disagrees. We're not going to go that that way in um, in a sermon. Now, this this may seem very very kind of rigid and staged, but it actually, as the Latins exercised it, and as modern rhetoric exercises it, it's very flexible. You can move these things around, but the but you know you need a conclusion. You need you, I mean you need an introduction. You need a conclusion, but in between, in terms of making the body of your argument, listing your major points. Um, supporting that with evidence and then making, identifying what the possible arguments are against you and addressing those, all of those are very valid aspects of a sermon, or uh, particularly of a sermon, or even of a teaching. And uh, I'm, I'm going to risk something here now, and we're going to spend the rest of the time we're going to talk today on this. Um, Lynn, since you're such closest, could you pass those out? If everybody wanted to bring back our After While I was preparing this and working on it, I was thinking to myself, well, Ross, how well do you follow this kind of idea? My training is in communication. Uh, it wasn't in formal rhetoric. I discovered rhetoric much later. But I thought, well, what about your sermons, Ross? So I went back to my last one. This is the sermon I preached last week. Why we believe in the resurrection, February 8th. And I was actually very pleased and quite surprised at how accurately I, I followed my own instruction here. Now, this isn't—it's it's not exactly point, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six. But um, I want to—I want to spend some time going through this and dissecting it, and in order to give you a practical example of how these kinds of things fit into, as a case study, fit into a sermon. 
Um, and again, I did not, when I say it's flexible, the idea is this is a great model for you to use, I believe, these six points, when you are constructing any kind of talk. A, a sermon, a speech, um, with slight adjustment, adjustment, even a, a teaching, a Bible study, something of that sort. But once you get used to doing this, which I've been, I've been preparing presentations for a lot of years now, uh, one kind or another. And so it becomes sort of second nature. And I did not sit down and say, okay, you know, my, my introduction, my rhetorical introduction will be this, and then the, you know, the partitio and then all of that stuff. I just did it. But then I go back and look at it and realize that I pretty well ingrained these things as a process because it does line up. I am not presenting this sermon to you as the perfect example of anything. In fact, as I say, I'm doing it a considerable personal you know, risk of reputation here to, to walk through it in this way, but I want you to see an example of a prepared sermon and how this sort of outline fits with that. Does that make sense? Any questions? Hopefully this will be a very practical kind of instructional thing. I, I don't expect we'll spend an hour and a half on this, but let's see what we can do. So first, this, as I said, is why we believe in the resurrection, a sermon I preached last Sunday here at Lakeside Presbyterian Church. The first part of the, the rhetorical, the six rhetorical steps, is the introduction. Tell them what's at stake and why it's important. Now, you will notice on the sermon I just gave you, the first thing that I do is I, I start by saying, we're continuing our sermon on why we believe, why it's thoroughly reasonable to believe in God, um, and to address some of the major objections. So I tell them what we're doing. You know, where are we going with this? Then I introduce a scripture passage, which is the basis. Um, and this scripture passage is chosen because it says, basically, if the resurrection doesn't, isn't true, then we're in trouble. We should be pitied above all people. Okay? So I'm, I'm sort of setting the argument up with that. And then I go on. You'll notice at the bottom of page one, um, I identify what I said last week, and then I said, um, more specifically, our Christian faith stands or falls on one aspect about Jesus, and that is the belief that on the third day, on page two now, following his death, he was resurrected, coming back from the dead, proving that he was and is the Son of God. This is without doubt the most critical doctrine of the Christian faith. Why is this important? Okay, what are we talking about? Why is it important? And then I quote Michael Green in his book, The Day Death Died where he talks about without it there'd be no Christianity at all, and he says, disprove it, that is the resurrection, and you have disposed of Christianity. So the idea that we tell them what's at stake, you know, where we're going, what's at stake, why is it important? Without this, Christianity doesn't work. It falls apart. Now that's at the start of my sermon. That's my introduction. <laughs> Bless you. Questions about that? See that? Makes sense? We then go to the second thing, stating the case, giving the main argument and all the relevant information. Now, um, I'm going to. This is not all exactly lined up one, two, three, four, five, six, but generally, if you go to page three, at the very top, um, stating the main argument, relevant information in terms of why we believe in the resurrection. Remember, that's the theme: why we believe in the resurrection. I would start by saying we believe it because it has all the marks of being true. It makes complete sense to accept the biblical accounts of the resurrection as a reliably reported historical event, and that's what I want us to look at. That's the main argument. This is a reliable historical event. I then have, um, I'm going to come back to that next paragraph to help us all be using more quotes in a second, uh, actually at the end, because I'm going to talk about some devices that I use that you could use. Um, I go to a quote, the, um, the quote, for example, Dr. Wilbur Smith, professor at Trinity Evangelical Seminary, one of the most important biblical scholars of the 20th century, put it like this, let it simply be said we know more about the details of the hours immediately before and the actual death of Jesus in and near Jerusalem than we know about the death of any other one man in all the ancient world. So I've given the main argument, and now I'm giving information in support of that, right up front. I'm giving a quote from an expert who says, we know more about the death of Jesus and what happened around that than any other ancient character. And then I quote um, another, and this is further over, but I'm still sort of in the main body of the argument, 
this is um, on the top of page four. Famed Cambridge scholar and Professor Brooke Foss Westcott said, indeed, taking all the evidence together, it's not too much to say there is no historic incident better or more variously supported than the resurrection of Christ. So I've introduced, I told them where we're going, what I'm going to tell them, and then the body, I state the case, I give the main argument, this is a historical thing, and I give two quotes to support that, the relevant content, all right? Is that clear? Mm -hmm. Now you'll notice that we're still, this is a 10-page document, this is longer than my usual sermon, and I still have, am just barely on to the start of page four, making the basic argument. Then, the third point is to out uh, the third stage is outline the major point, name the issues in dispute, and list the arguments. Uh, if we go to page four on the sermon, uh, second paragraph down, I, I've quoted these bold statements about the historicity of Jesus and his resurrection. Such bold statements. In support of the historicity of the resurrection, and thousands more I could quote from great scholars and legal minds reflect that the accepted gospel accounts are full of historical facts. We have details on the day and time Jesus died, the location, the events of his several trials, details of his torment at the hands of the soldiers, the procession, da 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 da. You know, all of these details. Um, and on and on, historical detail after historical detail. So, I've outlined more content behind the main point, and the I'm defending it. I'm listing the arguments in favor of that. Why do we say that this is a historical account? Um, you'll notice that I said uh, bold comments in support of historicity, the resurrection, thousands more I could quote from great scholars and legal minds. So I've left, I've left the potential there for there to be a lot more supporting information, even though I can't quote it all in a sermon. And then I go through, I'm going to talk about this uh, cumulatio, it's called, where I'm listing all of these things, and then draw the conclusion, and on and on, historical detail after historical detail, in support of my, my contention that we believe in the resurrection because it is a historical event. So this is all in support of that main theme, that main point. <clears throat> right? Questions or comments about that? Are we good? Mm -hmm. We're going to be done in 10 minutes. Um, we then come to the proof of the case to confirm or validate the content that we have presented earlier in the Miracchio and Partitio. Um, go back to page 3. So I've said it's historical. I've said why it's historical. On page 3 at the top, in... Um, Um, I'm sorry, at the bottom. Third paragraph in the bottom. I say that in terms of having, this is in support of, of my contention, the historicity, etc. I say that because when information about any event is published, there are still people alive who are eyewitnesses of that event, and those people are able to verify whether the written report is true. So we can reasonably ask ourselves whether it's likely the Gospels describing events that occurred only 20 to 40 years prior to their writing would have been accepted and cherished as they were if the stories in them were false or mythical. And then I give an example. It would be like someone today publishing a biography of John F. Kennedy that was full of stories and facts that simply were not true. The book would be contradicted at once. In the same way, it is very unlikely that the accounts of the resurrection given by the Gospel writers could be pure invention and yet went unchallenged in the first century. So here I'm providing the proof of the case. How people should understand it I mean, in terms of why can I say that this is historical? All the historical facts, nobody in the first century that we're, that we're aware of at all challenged it, even though there were people alive who knew about it, who knew the events. In other words. Okay? And then, point five, to refute possible opposing arguments. Now, because of the nature of my um, sermon, there's more time spent on that than, than anything else. Uh, in the middle of page four, I've been talking about it's historical, here's why it's historical, here are quotes to demonstrate that, etc., etc., etc. And then in the middle of page four, I say, nevertheless, in the centuries following the event, the resurrection, 
There have been many attempts to discredit, uh, to discredit reports of a resurrection. Of all those attempts, it is fair to say that only five arguments against the resurrection have come to remain. <clears throat> yeah. the, the idea here is to refute the, opposing, or the possible opposing arguments. Uh, the five accepted as the most likely non-supernatural explanations of what happened 2,000 years ago. Those five arguments are the swoon theory, the hallucination theory, the wrong tomb theory, the theft theory, and the Passover plot. Let's take a few moments and look at whether any of these, the five very best attempts to explain away the resurrection, make any sense to us. And then I go into each one of those in sufficient detail to make, at the bottom of page four, for instance, we start with the swoon theory, to make their case and say, here's what they're saying, and then I argue in each case why that doesn't fit with the facts or doesn't make sense or is not viable. And in each case, um, like you'll see in the middle of page five, I've outlined, here's what that would mean. Think for a moment about what this theory is suggesting. And I give all of those facts. And then I say, does that sound a little far-fetched to you? I call them to make a judgment about it. Um, and then I give some other supporting facts about the Roman executioners, the people who took Jesus down from the cross, how they didn't perceive that, that Jesus was still alive, even though they would have wanted to. I go into the hallucination theory, the wrong tomb theory, the theft theory. Again, this is the biggest part of the sermon. And then the Passover plot theory. Um, each of those, I present their case, and then I say why that doesn't make sense or doesn't fit the facts. And I'm going to come back and talk a little bit about um, the use of examples and humor and, thing like, humor and things like that. But you see the opposing argument part. And then the conclusion. Sum up the arguments and arouse sympathy for the case. Um, if you go to here, page 9. At the very top, these five, the best theories ever developed to try to explain away the resurrection, just don't make any sense. As we say in the South, that dog won't hunt. And that's, you know, use of humor. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Need I say more? My final two points are ones I've suggested before but need to be emphasized. The first is the complete failure of the Jewish and Romans authorities to even try to refute. And again, what I'm doing is I'm coming in the back and, and I'm re-emphasizing, even though I've suggested them before, what I think are the two most important points, the failure of the Jewish and Roman authorities to refute the, the claims of the resurrection, and um, second, to me the most compelling, and this is two-thirds of the way down on page nine, um, reason to believe the resurrection accounts as the extraordinary effect it had on the followers of Jesus, and I talk about how that's so. So this is my conclusion. I'm, I'm, I've discounted all of the arguments against. I'm making a statement about what we believe, and I'm giving the two strongest arguments in favor of it, uh, I believe. Then I continue with that on the last page, two more quotes, we'll talk about quotes in a minute, from John Stott and from famed Harvard jurist Dr. Simon Greenleaf, who has a law school named after him, the law school at Biola University is called the Greenleaf School of Law. And I say, and then, this then is the resurrection of Jesus. It is the most fundamental belief of all Christians, the thing on which our faith is built, and this is why we believe it. Amen. Now, I didn't do a long conclusion there, but you will notice I use inclusive pronouns. This is our faith. It is what we believe. And after having made that argument, I, I simply stated pretty much as a fact. This is, this is the resurrection. This is why it's true. This is what we believe. And I didn't, I didn't you know, Labor the point. Now, if, if this was a sympathetic audience, you know, I know most of them aren't Christians, most of them, and so I didn't feel like I needed to hit them again, sort of thing. Just draw a conclusion to it. And, and that's how I did it. Questions about all of that? Do you not feel that keeping things very short at the end, like so precise and concise that? You are relating more conviction, more, um, like this is the end. There's no more discussion about this. This right. is the, the penalty of it. Enough said. Enough yeah. Words. yeah. It, it, it's, it's done. You know? I think that's true. I don't know that I was conscious of that when I did it, but I think you're absolutely right, and I think that's the effect. I've made these, again, this was a longer than usual sermon. 
Um, ordinarily, I go seven pages, maybe into eight. This is ten, nine and a half. Um, and I know when I prepare a sermon, how long it's going to take. I knew this was going to be long, um, but I didn't feel like it was something I wanted to cut because it held together for me. Um, so, but yeah, I get to got to the end, and I thought that I, there's no reason to delay the points. I don't need to go back and say everything again. I've said them in great detail, and some of the things I've said more than once already. So I did not see the need to do that. Um, other questions, Carol. This is more like a comment. Um, in selling, which is very similar, um, a lot of times we don't address objections for fear of raising objections that weren't there in the first place. In this case, it's almost like the objections are part of the proof. Exactly. Uh, and um, and so it, you know you kind of I see it as as proof, and then the and then the final two points are more proof and more proof. And of course, you've already addressed the objections because that was part of your proof. Right. So it, I think that what you said before about flexibility, you know, sometimes you want to address a lot of objections, and sometimes you don't even want to bring up some right. of the silly objections that people might not have even heard of and would just raise questions. That's absolutely true. <clears throat> you know, and if it was some very detailed theological, you know, objection that people probably are not going to be aware of anyway, then why in the world would you raise it? But these actually are the primary arguments people make. And like the swoon theory is probably the most popular. And, I make, I'm, uh, and I'm going to look at that in a little more detail in a minute when I talk about what's called accumulatio, you know, where you pile up, very quickly pile up evidence, uh, sort of a tour de force, a stream of stuff. And, you know, it, this, it's kind of overwhelming. And then you draw a quick conclusion to it. You don't waste a lot of time. I, I did that with regard to swoon, wound, the swoon theory. But an example, I was not afraid in here. And I even said in the sermon, and it's not in the written part, but I, because I, some things I just say. I said, excuse me if I seem kind of flip about some of this, but some of these things are pretty ridiculous. And it's very hard to present them without you know, be completely serious because they're very hard, like the, the wrong tomb theory. Um, I wrote and, and preached, this theory says that within three days of burying Jesus, the man whom they loved dearly, whom they believed to be the Son of God, and whose death had shattered them, that within just three days, all the apostles and disciples of Jesus simply forgot where he was buried. They walked to the graveyard, and instead of stopping at Jesus' grave, they looked into someone else's tombs. And then, having forgotten where Jesus was buried, they then, without having seen the risen Christ, pre reacted by preaching and teaching that he'd been resurrected, so that many of them would eventually die terrible deaths because of their poor sense of direction and their short-term memory issues. <laughs> so, I'm, that's tr I'm, not, I'm, you know, I'm not going too far, I don't think, in sort of parodying it. But I'm pointing out just how ridiculous that is, you know. And I go further and say that, that in these accounts, we have all this minute detail, all very specific, handed down to us by eyewitness to the events. And some people would suggest that these same folks, who a short time later launched a movement that would change the Roman Empire in less than 100 years, that these people just forgot where Jesus was buried? I'm sorry, I just can't buy that. So... The idea of raising the objections is, I know, I have heard people say, well, I don't think Jesus really died on the cross, I think he just swooned. Or, you know, well, I think they just misplaced the body. I don't think that, I don't think he really was resurrected. Well, I, sometimes we need to not be afraid to, that's what people say. And I present it in such a way to try to make people realize how ridiculous that sounds. And so, but you're right, there are some times that you don't, if the objections are subtle or they're not widely known or they're not something people would, you know, naturally tend to want to think, then no. But in this case, when you talk about the resurrection, these are the five things people will have heard from somebody who won't believe it. Okay? I notice, um, not in your printed words, but in your actual presentation, you never mentioned the, the sightings of Jesus, um, you know, by the apostles and, and others. Um, was there a reason for that? Um, no, I... Didn't I? I thought you did. Yeah. I thought I did. Yeah, like 500 people. Yeah, I talked about 500 people witnesses. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah you talked about witnesses a couple places. Now, I didn't go into a lot of detail about that, but there's more than one place where I said a lot of people saw him. In fact, more than 500, it's reported. Um, and that, that, oh, under the mass hallucination, especially. Oh, the okay. idea that there's 500 people, and I, I talked about how um, 
there are certain kind of characteristics which psychologists and psychiatrists say are necessary for someone to be to experience hallucinations. And I, I quickly say what that is, and I said, so we're, we're to be believe that 500 people of all different backgrounds, all different temperaments, different places, different times, different, different motivations, would all have had exactly the same hallucination. And then I talk about the fact that they all not only saw Jesus, they touched him, they talked to him, they heard him, they ate with him, you know, for 40 days. Um, and again, to, to make a, a clear argument that that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, that it doesn't fit the characteristics of what a hallucination is supposed to be, according to psychiatrists. And um, it doesn't hold water. And then I make a couple of other arguments about the consequences of that would be, why didn't the Jews and Romans just lose the body if it was all a hallucination? Why didn't they do anything to try to dis specifically discount it? Okay. Other questions about that? Bob? I'm just thinking this same basic structure applies to a lot of things, mm -hmm. like essay writing, for mm -hmm. instance, or scientific writing uses the same structure. Right. Even a three-act play. Uh, Television, for instance, when some politician makes a big speech, the uh, talking heads will come on and they're going to tell you what the guy is going to say, and then the politician says what he's going to say, and then the talking heads come back on and tell you what he said. <laughs> and then usually a couple of guys come on and one guy says, this guy's the greatest genius who ever lived, and the other guy says, no, he's the biggest idiot that ever lived. So they're following basically the same type of structure. Right. This goes all the way back to the ancient Greeks. I mean, Aristotle wrote about it. Um, Cicero, Pentillion, and other rhetoricians in Latin Rome uh, defined all this as a discipline. And we forget the fact that up until the 19th century, you know, late 19th century, probably into the 20th century in some schools, rhetoric was considered one of the basic skills to be learned. One of the part of the trivium, one of the three easier of the seven liberal arts. And everybody was taught how to do this. And the reason I'm using the classical kind of approach to it is because, and the reason that you recognize it in other kinds of effective communications is because it is a, it is the standard model. And yet, a lot of people don't get it. And that's why I'm presenting it to you because to start with this model and to recognize, okay, I need an introduction. I need to have um, basically present the case and outline my major points. I need to make the main arguments. I need to uh, support those arguments. I need to consider what opposition or what, what might be against this and address those things. And then I need to have a compelling conclusion to sort of wrap up and to, to get people to agree, yes, I, I think you're right. Those stages, now, and, and once you, you outline that, and I think a good way to present we're talking homiletics here, a good way to create a sermon, a teaching, a speech. Start out with six points on your computer screen or your you know, notepad, you know, six pages, whatever. And build it based upon that structure. This is the framework that you're going to hang everything on. That's the reason I'm presenting this to you and why I'm giving you an example of how I did that last week. Now, I didn't start with the six, but again, I've been doing this long enough that it just sort of naturally happens for me. And I was surprised at exactly how much this lined up since I didn't start with the six point outline. But uh, all the elements are here, and I would venture to say that to a greater or lesser degree, hopefully greater, that most of my sermons would follow a very similar kind of structure because it's an effective way to try to make an argument for you. Fair? Any other questions or comments about the process? Because this is, I want today, I want us to talk about that process. Principles are the same between teaching and preaching itself. Um, have, have you ever, ever done any street preaching? No. Okay. And I've done quite a bit in my time. In that Good area. for you. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a challenge. It's yeah. it's a challenge. <laughs> I, that's not going to call that experience. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's just uh, dealing with hecklers and stuff like that. How do you deal with that and still get a message across? Yeah. You know, that type of thing. So, Which yeah. is Dealing with hecklers and external interference and problems like that is actually a different stage of the rhetorical process. Right. This is actually how you construct your talk. Mm -hmm. um, but then when you present it, you have to be prepared to deal with potential interference. You know? um, and that, that comes 
um, in the later stage as we talk about through this process, uh, the actual presentation part. But uh, yeah, it's it, but you have to be clear on, and this is. The Latins were very good about thinking clearly. In fact, mm -hmm. um, J.I. Packer, I had Calvin's Institute with J.I. Packer, and I, I mentioned to Dr. Packer one day that I would like to study Latin. Still haven't done it. I'm studying Spanish very much. Um, and he said to me, if you study Latin, your thinking will clarify. And he's somebody who's fluent in Latin. Um, because Latin is a very, a very pared down language, you know, it is very succinct, it is very much to the point. That's why, you know, you'll get a nine, nine or ten word English phrase, and they'll give you the Latin version of it, and it'll be four words, you know, because they're, they're, it's a very succinct language. And the Latin rhetoricians who created this kind of model, they thought very succinctly, and they only included the parts you really need in order to make that all work. Really? Um, because I do a lot of persuasive writing, I think that it's also important to know that you don't have to you don't have to write it in order. I mean, you can start with your argument, whatever excites you, and then come back and say, "Now, how do I introduce this?" I think you're exactly you know, right. Or, or what? Am, you might really start with your conclusion, and what do I want people to do? Mm -hmm. That's. That's often where I start. Yeah, <laughs> it's and, right and at the conclusion end. Conclusion can involve a call to action. Yeah. You know, to do something. Yeah, exactly. Which especially in marketing materials, yeah. that's it. Um, you're absolutely right. I, I mentioned to you the last week or the week before that my preaching professor, Ian Pat Watson, um, best preacher ever. Ian, the way he started to prepare a sermon is he would he would have decided, as we talked about before, that like inventio. What am I being called to do? Who am I speaking to? And what do I think I should say to them? He'd start with that. But then he would take a blank piece of paper. And I don't think Ian was probably very computer oriented because he older guy and is a Scottish preacher. And he would start just, you know, writing thoughts without any concern about organization. Thoughts, scripture verses that came to mind, you know, points he wanted to make, words he thought were very strong that he wanted to make sure he put, whatever that is. And once he had sort of this brain dump, and this is a strategy they use for, for creative thinking, brainstorming in uh, corporations as well. He, once he captured, just got down all that stuff, then he would go back and worry about organizing. And as Carolyn was just saying, it doesn't mean you make these six points and you say, okay, my, my introduction, what do I want to say? You may go straight to the main argument, or you may go straight to the conclusion, or you may be thinking in terms of here, here's the opposition that I need to be prepared to address. That may be the first thing that comes to your mind. And then you start, you can start anywhere and then organize it from that. And then if for instance you know that the opposition is very strong, you know the arguments against this are very strong, or people have a real bias against it, you might, you know, you might open with Many people these days are saying, and you make the opposing argument, and you, you deal with that first, and respond to it and answer it, and then you go on to the rest of it. So there is flexibility here, it's not, but this is, a, this is the way to start, to organize any of these kind of talks. Um, and it works, it works and has been working for several thousand years. Um, other questions? I have to laugh about this because if you've watched any of, uh, he's kind of out there, he's no longer with us, but Gene Scott, he was like, <laughs> oh yeah, how do you keep track of what he's telling you? Yeah, he was insane. Yeah. I mean, literally, he yeah. was insane. Yeah. Gene Scott was a preacher in Southern California, Dr. Gene Scott. Yes. And in between pictures of the racehorses he had just bought. Um, he had this big whiteboard, and he would teach this stuff, and he would write on the whiteboard, and he never erased. Which meant he'd go to the board, and he's writing, and there were 50 layers of colored marker there. You couldn't tell if he was writing. <laughs> and he, was just, he was, I really think he was mentally ill, but he had a regular program on Channel 40 in Southern California for many, many, many years. Um, and he wore a fur coat. Mm -hmm. and, and smoke cigars. Smoke cigars. Yeah. And he had a hat that said, uh, kill a piss ant for Jesus. I think it's him. <laughs> Why did you bring him up? <laughs> the anti-rhetorician. No. Yeah. 
That's sort of the anti-Ross. <laughs> He's a character. Other questions about this process. Do you get it? Do you feel it's helpful? Again, I'm trying to give you a, do this as a case study so that you have an example. You, know, you can take that home. Um, if you have a chance to breach it sometime, go ahead. You get my permission. But think about it in terms of structure. Doesn't follow exactly one, two, three, four, five, six. I, you know, it moves around a little bit in the middle, but fundamentally, it follows this this approach. And because this again has been around for thousands of years as a as a rhetorical approach to constructing an argument, a sermon, a speech, a legal defense, whatever whatever it is you want to do. Marvin, I'm looking at this series. You know why we believe in God, in the Bible, in Jesus, in the resurrection, and so on. Um, Okay. I'm anticipating possibly the next series or annex series, which is going to be, so what? If you believe all this and it's proven to you true, then what are you going to do with it? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, as a believing Christian saved by Jesus Christ, what is going to be the effect on your life? What does God require of you? <laughs> yeah. so, it's, uh, Good. That sounds like, sounds like a suggestion. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, one of the first series that I did when I started preaching here was a series called The Big Rocks. I um, don't know if you've heard the, the story. A consultant was dealing with um, doing management consulting, and he used a, a practical illustration for people. He had a big glass jar, and he, in front of everybody, he took all these, he had these big rocks, and he puts all the big rocks in there. And he, you know, right up to the top, and he says, is this, no, so tell me, is this full? And they go, yeah, it looks pretty full. It's really. So he reaches down and gets gravel. And he sort of pours the gravel in and sifts it down, and all the gravel sifts down in between the big rocks. And he says, okay, now is it full? And they go, yeah, it's full. Really? And he reaches down, and sand, and he pours sand in, and it filters down amongst the rocks, and right up to the top. And they go, okay, is it full now? And they go, yeah, it's full now. Really? Pulls out water, and he pours the water in. <laughs> And, you know, fills it up. He goes, is it full now? They go, yeah, it's full now. I said, yeah, it is full now. He said, so what's the moral of this story? And he was talking about time management, you know, part of it. And they said, well, that means you can always get more in. He went, no, that's not the point. It's not that you can always get more in. The moral of the story is if you want to get the big rocks in, you have to put them in first. <laughs> well, the first series of sermons I did were the basic beliefs of the faith. You know, what, it, what we believe. Preaching now on why we believe, and and this I think this is helpful too because you all have to decide if you end up teaching or preaching on a regular basis, you need to think about series. You need to think about where the people are and what they need, and how, you know how you're going to preach to that. I felt like um, I think I've told the story here. I think it was in here about having somebody say something to me that even though they've been in the church their whole life, indicated they had zero understanding of what the Christian faith was really about. And so I was preaching this because I thought, well, I want to be a preacher. I want to start out with, here are the basic beliefs of the faith, the big rocks, the first things we have to be clear on. Um, and we're doing the why we believe now. And I thought, well, maybe the what we believe would come after, but maybe the what we do with it comes after. And that's the sort of decision you have to make if you're going to be involved in teaching or preaching on a regular basis. Okay. Chris? If you were teaching, for example, a series on the, uh, the Sermon on the Mount, well, you know, you're kind of going, you're on the same topic, probably for a fairly long time because it's pretty long. Would you use it, I mean, do you have to put the arguments in or the, the rebuttals or the, the refutation, you know, people refuting it, or do you, you, would you slip on that or just hardly put it in? Well, it, it depends upon, and this is the basic, a basic outline to use, but not everything applies to this. Okay. Um, if you got to a section in the Sermon on the Mount, like the Beatitudes, uh, blessed are the you know blessed are the meek for they will inherit the earth. You're going to have somebody in your congregation who's thinking the meek don't inherit anything. I don't care what you say. And so in that case, you need to be prepared in some way to refute that, maybe by examples in history of the meek who truly did were victorious, even though it didn't look like it at first or whatever. Um, so there may be aspects even in that case where you do this. But it is true that there's certain kinds of sermon series and uh, even topical sorts of things 
that may not have all of these pieces. And again, this is not to be bondage. This is not, you know, you're not going, oh, I really can't, I don't, that, I don't know what to refute, so I can't. That's okay. You have some flexibility with this. And if you're doing, I've done sermon series, I did a long series of called People of Faith. It was, it was characters of the Bible, starting with Genesis and going all the way up into the New Testament. I mean, that was a year or something that I was doing this. And I would just come to the next character in the Bible and talk about that person and, and, and not just who they were and what they did and why they were important, although that was all in there, but also why they're important. Why are they in here? You know, what do they teach us? Um, so that what lessons do we learn from Joshua or from you know, uh, one of the prophets or whoever? Now, in that case, there would not be a lot of <coughs> to refute. There wouldn't be counter arguments so much. It's sort of all positive. And I wouldn't feel, I didn't feel, wouldn't feel an obligation to incorporate that sort of thing. But in any sermon I would prepare, I would sort of start with this, and then it would be a conscious decision if there's some aspect of this that I need to take out. So it's fine to drop one of these pieces out, but don't do it by accident, do it on purpose, because I don't need that for this, or I want to rearrange it, or whatever. Make it an intentional act, not an accidental one. Okay. There's almost always an objection to changing your life, <laughs> you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So if if you're getting people to, to do something different from what they normally do, you, there's probably something that yeah. right. that that they'll object to. Exactly, and and you, and you need to respond to it. I mean, Marvin's suggesting that we do. Now, what do you do with it? Yeah. Well, almost anything that that once you've established what we believe and why we believe it, you're saying now what do you do with it. Any point you make. You're going to have to argue in favor of it and against the opposition to it because if it was obvious, then they'd already be doing it. Yeah. The fact that they're not, you need to say it, means there's something you need to refute in order to get them turned around on that. So you can, if you think through it, you can begin to see that these points do apply to most circumstances to a greater or lesser extent. But it's a great place to start as an outline. Okay. Other questions or comments? Well, I don't have another uh, an hour worth more material, but I do have some other things I want to talk about. So why don't we power through for about another 20 minutes or so, and you guys get off early today. Because, you know, I, I went through that stuff really fast. Um, I want to give some <coughs> creative points from this sermon. And again, please understand, I'm not saying this is the best sermon ever or that this, you know, whatever. I, I, think, I hope it's a good example for you and that it's useful. Um, but some of the creative points... Um, and I didn't mean for this all to come up at once. This thing does weird stuff when I when I transfer it onto this computer. It, it takes stuff out, moves it around. Uh, first, tell them where you're going and why it's important. This is one of the premises of the introduction. But uh, you read in the sermon, I start out by saying we're continuing our sermon series on this topic. Today we're talking about this. And I give them a scripture and then I say, here's why this is important. Um, tell them what you're going to tell them. Is, uh, that sort of tell them what you want to tell them, what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them is absolutely accurate. I think that is absolutely uh, part of the structure. Secondly, use expert quotes to establish credibility. I quoted more in this sermon than any other sermon that I think I've ever used because there's a lot of historical and, and, and legal, you know, there's several people like Simon Greenleaf whose expertise, you know, he wrote one of the foremost books on uh, on evidential stuff, on evidence and use of evidence of anybody. It's, it's one of the, you know, so somebody who talks about whether there's evidence for the Christian faith, then he's a good one. Uh, John Stott, who many people know his name, etc. So use expert quotes to establish credibility. Don't usually overdo it. All right? It's, you can't, it can't just end up like a long series of quotes. In fact, the um, Josh McDowell book that we use for the apologetics class. That's pretty much what it is. It's this massive body of quotes, which is great for a reference, but not so good for a sermon. You know, you've got to break that up. But, point number three, give yourself permission to do something unusual or not ordinary. Because I was using more quotes than usual, I gave myself permission by telling him I was going to do it, and that it was okay. I did that. I said it's okay. Um, my exact words were, I will be using more quotes than is usual, quotes from historians, scholars, and judges, people with special training and expertise in, and then on. 
So if you're going to be doing something a little out of the ordinary or that you think might be um, a hitch for somebody, a hang up, a hurdle, anything that you think might be an objection in, in what you're doing and how you're presenting, give yourself permission by saying it. Nobody's going to come back to me later and say, you know, I like the sermon, but man, you had way too many quotes. Because I told them I was going to and that there was a reason for it. Right? Um, fourth, make judicious use of catchphrases to sum up your major points. Judicious. If, you, if everything is, you know, is catchy phrases, you know, if everything has the same letter to start, if there's, everything is a, a part of an acronym, that gets real hokey real fast. But, for instance, um, in the sermon I was talking about the, the fact that the resurrection, that the Christian faith would not exist without the resurrection, I used the line, the empty tomb was in fact the cradle of the church. This illustrative kind of catchphrase that the church would not exist. The church was born with the resurrection, the empty tomb. Um, you can capture people's attention and imagination. I've got a number of those that I've used over the years. Uh, my people have heard me say any number of times, you cannot be a person of faith and a person of fear at the same time. You've heard me say that. Yes, many times. And so, and I come back to that because that's an important thing I want you to remind me of. And that's one of the values of a catchphrase is you can use it over time if it's, if it's appropriate to them. Um, surprise them by arguing the other side. In this sermon, early on, after I say how important the resurrection is, I say, of course people would question the resurrection. What person in their right mind would accept without question that anyone really died and really came back from the dead? And I go on, and then I say, there's simply no way anybody can believe such a tale unless, of course, it were true. So anybody in the, in the congregation whose thought was, ah, did somebody come back from the dead? Who could believe that? I'm talking to them. Of course somebody could believe. Who in their right mind would believe that's true? You couldn't believe something like that unless it really is true. And then I tell them why I believe it's really true. But by that point, you know, they're, they're in the boat with us rather than just, you know, shut, shut the whole thing out. By arguing the other side just briefly and then giving the catch, yes, but what if it's true, and then making the argument for why it's true, then all those people who might have had that objection are pulled in. Make sense? Okay. Um, use a modern and relevant example to illustrate a point. When I talk about the fact that the um, gospel writers wrote their gospels when people would still be alive, especially the first three gospel writers, and that there were people alive who would know that it was wrong, I said, it'd be like someone today publishing a biography of John F. Kennedy that was full of stories and facts that simply were not true. The book would be contradicted at once in the same way. It is very unlikely that the accounts of the resurrection given by the gospel writers could be pure invention and yet went unchallenged in the first century. So when I say, well, the gospel writers wrote within 30 to 40 years of Jesus, people are having may have trouble thinking what that, you know, picturing that. If I say, imagine if somebody today wrote a book about John F. Kennedy, who almost everybody in that congregation, unless they're a teenager, will have remembered it, probably knew where they were when he was killed, uh, and how upset they were that that was all that was on TV for about a week, you know, right, as kids. Um, but we all remember that. We were alive when he, when he died. So, so the suggestion that it would be like writing a book about, about JFK that was wrong, there were still people alive who could refute that. People can relate to that. They would have a sense of it. Whereas they might not be able to picture Jesus died in 30 or 40 years later when they write the, the biographies. Um, and why is that important? Then they use quick lists to build the argument. What in rhetoric is called the cumulatio. Um, we have details on the date and time Jesus, day and time Jesus died, the location, the events of the several trials. Now, part of this is the audible kind of assault. Maybe that's too strong a word, but the idea that this is boom, 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 and then you draw a conclusion carries a lot of weight. It's like you know, it's it's a verbal kind of. Uh, you know, you're storming the gates on them. Um, details of his torment in the hands of the soldiers, of the procession to the place of execution with Simon of Cyrene carrying the cross, of the location of the crucifixion, the action of the Roman guards. 
etc. Comments from the other two crucified victims. The wording of the sign posted above Jesus' head. The words Jesus said. The witnesses who were there. What time he died. How and when his body was removed. And on and on. Historical detail after historical detail. You see what I'm doing there? Boom, 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 boom. The weight of evidence is made more obvious when you... There's a staccato kind of pouring on of all of these details. Marvin? And you didn't get lost in the details and start ex extemporizing this one and that one and the other one, so you lose the whole force of everything because you don't have to explain what all the words said on the box. You don't have to explain all the... Exactly. Know, it's the list of and what's the point? And the reason is because the point I'm making is we have all this detail. Boom, 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 detail, and on and on. You know, which is why, and again, this is in support of the idea that this is a historical event. Because if it wasn't a historical event, they'd just say, well, this guy, they took him out, you know, they tried him, took him out and crucified him. So I hear. There's no evidence in that, there's no suggestion in that that that's a historical event, whereas here, it is. And that repetition of rapid-fire details uh, makes the point. And again, the, the goal here is not to manipulate people, but it is to persuade people. I'm not trying to twist their arm, you know, to force their submission to something. I'm just trying to convince them that this makes sense, that this is true. Uh, use humor, but only in a way that makes sense in the context. When I'm talking about the Passover plot, which you can read in there, is pretty ridiculous. It, it, it does sound like a spy thriller. And I say, after I lay it all out, I say devious plots, mysterious sleeping drugs, induced coma, sneaking past Roman guards at the cross and then again at the tomb, spiriting away a not quite but almost dead body in the night. Somebody cue the Mission Impossible music. And when I said almost dead, um, Carolyn laughed because Princess Bride, you know, Billy Crystal character says, oh, he's not dead, he's uh, mostly dead. Actually, I think I changed that to mostly dead when I, when I did it in the sermon. This is the first draft I did. But he's not, not really dead, mostly dead. You know, it's okay. Um, okay. Carolyn caught that and laughed. But the idea, cue the Mission Impossible music. Now, I don't, people, people who start out saying, okay, I need a joke. Wrong! You do not use humor for the sake of humor. And you don't, you, you don't you're not looking for belly laugh humor. But, you know, people often laugh at my sermons, usually when I want them to. <laughs> not always. Um, but the idea, cue the Mission Impossible music, some people laughed at that. And then when I used the line, which you guys laughed at too, that dog won't hunt, after I've outlined all of the five arguments against the resurrection, and simply say they don't make sense, I use the southern expression, that dog won't hunt. Um, so humor is fine, but to me, don't start out, oh, I've got this really good joke, I need to figure out how to get it in. Develop your argument, and then, hopefully, there will be some humorous moments that come into it by, by nature. I mean, I, I, I have funny thoughts assaulting me all the time, and sometimes I put them in sermons. So, um, comment about that? Did somebody see anybody back there? Okay. Then, challenge your audience to think and then to agree with you. And I said this about the, um, the swoon theory. Think for a moment about what this theory is suggesting. After a night in which Jesus has had no rest, was given no food, endured the mockery of multiple trials, this is again one of that accumulatio, that sort of <coughs> barraging of facts. Endured the mo mockery of multiple trials, suffered because <coughs> of the flogging, and I, in the sermon I added, a flogging, and a, a Roman flogging itself was often failed. Jesus was crucified, perhaps the most painful way that has ever been found to execute a person. After appearing to be dead, being stabbed in the heart to prove it, he was given no food, no warmth, no medical care. And there again, that series, no food, no warmth, no medical care, the fact that I didn't use any connectors in there has more impact than say, he was given no food, in addition, there, he was not warmed, and there was nobody there to provide medical care. That's not nearly as strong as saying, no food, no warmth, no medical care. And it didn't take as long. Indeed, he was wrapped head to toe in burial clothes and spices and laid in a cold stone tomb where, after almost three days alone and without aid, he awakened. I went on to say, rolled away a stone that couldn't weigh as much as 2,000 pounds, sneaked by professional Roman guards who were there to, to save him or to guard him. And then he appeared in front of all his followers, not as a man who appeared half starved, half dead, you know, etc. 
but rather as one who could demonstrate to them that he had conquered death and been resurrected. And then I said, does that sound a little far-fetched to you? So I say, think about this. And I give them the facts, and I go, really? Is that what you think? Does that make sense to you? So challenge the people to think about it and draw their own conclusion. But you're telling them what conclusion they should draw if they're smart. That's part of the persuasion. Questions about that? There are other sort of rhetorical devices that are in there, you know, in addition to the sort of series of things. Um, and all of those, like no, no food, no more than the medical care, those are rhetorical devices where you're not writing it the same way you would if you were writing something for a scholarly journal, where you're expecting to use connecting materials. Your point is, vocally, verbally, you're presenting this stuff. And one of the other things you'll notice, uh, if you look at that, uh, you will see that there's quite a few times that things are underlined or they're bold-faced. Those are, in terms of practical preparation, those are, for me, visual cues for how I've decided when I was preparing this that I want to emphasize that. If there are underlines, if there are, I mean, there's some things that are underlined because they're titles or whatever. But if it's underlined, if it's boldface, or if it's both, that means that that's something I'm, when I actually say it, I want to emphasize. Now, you don't do that when you're writing something for publication. Unless you want an editor to come back and go, what is that all about? Um, for instance, on page 6, when I say, these witnesses did not simply have a vision of the risen Jesus, they spoke to him, listened to him, touched him, talked, walked with him, ate with him for 40 days. I want to make sure, and I've thought about that in advance, I want to make sure that when I'm, you know, when I'm giving this and when I'm glancing at my notes, I don't forget that my vocal intonation will make a huge difference in, in making that play, making that work in terms of the point I'm trying to make. Obviously, if I'd said, they did not simply have a vision of the risen Jesus, they spoke to him, listened to him, touched him, walked with him, ate with him for 40 days. That would not have nearly the same effect. So there's much in here that has to do with it being an oral presentation. Comments? Questions? Marvin? Well, I first, it has to be one of the couple of sermons that you could preach. Because it's a very difficult thing for the normal person to believe that someone raised from the dead. And so if they have all those proofs, is really getting us to turn 100% from what we normally think. You know, to believe something that seems so ridiculous, but when you preach it that way, it's like, it's the only thing that makes sense. You know? Well, Marvin heard it. Some of the others of you, I think, heard it. Did it work? Yeah. I'm not asking you to, you know, to compliment me. I'm saying, no. when it was presented orally, did it work? My friend Joan, who was new to the church, right. said to me, that was amazing. That okay. was the best yet. Uh, she's not used to hearing sermons, and she's heard a couple. And she was made positive comments about, I really like what man has to say and how he says it. Okay. But with that one, she was so embedded. That was the best yet. Well, I appreciate that. I guess I, I'm not I'm not digging for compliments here. I just want to know when I'm saying that here's a model, a case study for how we can do it. I want to hear if you, those of you who heard it thought it worked. Now. Uh, and I didn't go back to find one I thought was especially good or especially fit. I went back to the last one I preached. This was last Sunday. Um, so, Chris, you had your hand up? Yeah, you. So, I mean, maybe you're going to cover this in further classes, and if so, if I can wait. But, so you do the text, you write it out first, but then you you don't actually read it, do you? Or do you? I don't read. Uh, I, I know it well enough. I have it in front of me, and I'll be glancing down at it. I mean, does it seem like I'm reading, those of you who attend my sermons? No. So I don't read it, but I I write it out, I learn it well enough, and then this is just, you know, this keeps me in, yes. on track. Now the thing I used to do, and we will talk about this when we get to memory, uh, memoria, which is one of the steps, and that is, you know, do you memorize it? I think I told you that the story of um, Lloyd Ogilvy, who memorizes his sermons verbatim, and he got up one day and said, and after all, when things get, he has the voice of God. When things get tough, the tough get, and you can see him in his mind going back and going. He almost said, when things get tough, the tough get things. And he caught himself right before the last word and said, when things get tough, the tough get going. <laughs> 
So there's some danger in memorizing, right, sure. and he stands in the middle of the platform in his full, you know, reformed regalia and uh, and preaches that way. And he's brilliant. Okay. He was the, there's a reason he was made the chaplain of the U.S. Senate. But um, there is, see, I don't. I almost wish I did not write out. And I will sit down and think. I'm just going to outline. I know this well enough. I'm just going to outline it, and I'll sit down on the computer and I'll start outlining. And the next thing I know, I'm writing whole paragraphs, and it ends up being this. Not because I feel that this is an obligation. Now, what I used to do is I would do a text like this, and I would use a scholar's margin. In other words, I would have it two-thirds, one-third. And then in the left-hand column, I would, with a marker, big, big marker, you know, a, a fat sharpie, I would write words. That would cue me into each of the main points. So I both had the text there if I needed it, but I could just glance down and see that word and know where I'm going and where I am. Now, I don't do that anymore. I don't think I need to do that because I, but you'll notice this is 14 point type. And by the way, for the sake of saving paper, I printed it front and back for you all. Don't ever print anything you're presenting front and back. Um, one of the standard things is you should not be doing this, the visual disruption of that, turning pages as you're going along. Print it on, and, and you'll notice that when I do notes for class. When I, when I need to change the page, I just do that. I just slide it over. Much less visually disrupting, um, much less likely that you're, you know, you're going to get messed up with what page you're on there. Um, so I print it big enough that I can see it. I highlight things that I want to make sure that I hit or underline them, um, and I'm able to follow this without giving a sense that I'm reading. Because you don't want to be reading. That's one of the things the first week I said in terms of rules is right. that don't don't read to people. We'll talk more about ways, strategies, and processes by which you can get better at that. But how you can approach it so that you don't end up having to read it, but you still have clear. Even if you memorize, um, I have a book called. How to preach from memory. And most of it's not about actually memorizing. It's not actually about how to memorize your sermons. But one of the, it, it's how to know the stuff well enough, organize it, and all sorts of things. It's similar to some of the stuff in our book. But one of the things that they say early on is that if you do memorize your sermons, don't get up there without notes. Keep your notes in front of you because the catastrophe of having this brain freeze where you forget where you are, you don't know where you're going, you know. You don't need that, and the people you're reaching to don't need that. Um, I, I actually, in, in theater, that's called being up. You know that expression? When you forget your lines, you're up. Well, I was doing, it was a two-person play. It's, it's a um, dramatic, one-act one adaptation of uh, Mark Twain, um, Adam and Eve in the Garden. What's it called? It's not the name of it. It's, anyway, it's Adam and Eve in the Garden, and it's funny. Well, there was a woman who was Eve, and I was Adam, and we're doing, and I, this is the worst it's ever happened to me, and I've done a lot of theater. We're in the middle of the stage, in the middle of the play, and I look at her, and I could have been on Mars. I was completely lost. I didn't know where I was. I didn't know who she was. Who are those people? Why are these lights so bright? You know, I mean, I was just gone. As up as I had ever been in my whole life. And I'm looking at this woman, Dee Parham was her name. I look at Dee, standing about three feet from me, and I go, I see you now in a way I've never seen you before, which had nothing to do with the script. And so she knew I was in trouble. <laughs> so she leans down like she's playing in water, and then I immediately remember the next section is about, you know, talking about these weird animals and fish, and how what's that all about? And so then I remember my lines when we went ahead. And she, because she gave me that visual cue. Well, the same thing can happen to you preaching. You get up there and you have no notes in front of you, and you think you've got this call to write, and then your brain freezes on you, and you don't know who you are or where you are. It's bad enough to do that in a one-act play, but to do that when you're delivering God's, supposedly delivering God's word in a sermon, not, not good. Have your notes with you. Yes. I think one of the best... Um, messages I ever heard that was lengthy. It was about an hour presentation by the Canadian ambassador at the time. 
and he spoke to us here in uh, the Canadian Club. And when he got finished, he had so many facts and figures that I couldn't write them all down and still follow what he was saying. It was just jam-packed with information and really important, good information. I said to him, you should or could you have your secretary uh, send a copy so that we can have this in printed form? And he held up a recipe card, a small one, this big, with four or five words on it. Not one fact, not one number, although he quoted hundreds of numbers. And he said, I'm sorry, this is all I have. Yeah. And I thought, those words, did he say this? Like, I don't re remember them as being part. No, well, it was huge for him. Yeah, he knew his stuff, and all he needed was a cue to make sure he got the big sections in there. Now, if you really know your material, and it's true, like politicians, when when somebody's campaigning for a major office and they go from one place to the other, it's basically the same talk. I mean, they've got the facts, they learned them, they have to be prepared to deal with them in terms of questions or whatever, but it's not like they're coming up with new information every time. It's, in that regard, it's harder to be a preacher than it is to be a politician, because politicians, they don't have a wide variety of messages, and, you know, preachers, you better have something different to say next week, because unless you want your numbers to start going down, there's the, the old story about the black man who's asked to fill in as a preacher. Did I tell you that? Sorry, okay. You know, and after he preached the same sermon four times, they said, you know, you really don't have to preach anymore. He said, well, as soon as you start doing what I told you to do, I'll preach something else. Yeah. But usually that doesn't work very well, you know. Um, but yeah, it's, it's true that people are involved in certain kinds of things where they have, they can memorize the facts, they can memorize, because they're going to be dealing with all that same stuff all the time. We need to know scripture. We need to know where we're coming from on major topics, doctrinal issues, etc. But then you've got to prepare something that's at least appears fresh each time. Um, and two, to use that as an example, in that circumstance, using a lot of statistics and facts, etc., is, is valuable. For the most part, when you're preaching a sermon, having too many facts, too many numbers, too many statistical kinds of things is not good because people do get lost in it. Okay? Um, I preached the sermon on um, why we believe the Bible, and I used a few numbers. We have 5,686 right, um, ancient documents to support the Bible, almost five times more than any other um, ancient document. So I used a few facts in there, but not many. Not like the charts that I gave you guys. Uh, so you have to be careful. Other questions or comments? I hope this is helpful to you as a case study and, you know, uh, go through it. If you have any questions or you're working on it, please let me know. Other than that, you guys get a 40-minute vacation.